Welcome to Maritime Destination. Today we have uh, Captain Pradeep Chawla. He is a Group Managing Director of Key HSC and training with Angus and Shipman. He oversees Key HSC and training for over 650 vessels. He overlooks the training and development of over 28,000 sailing staff and 1,700 shore managers. Welcome, Captain Chawla, to Maritime Destination. Good evening. Thank uh, you for having me here. Sir, my first question is, uh, you started your shipping career in 1974 and you have announced your retirement from ASM in June 2023. In these 50 years of journey, what were five major events? Could you please share with our viewers? Okay. Yeah, that's one per every 10 years. Okay, so let's start with the sea carrier. So I was with the Shipping Corporation of India for my apprenticeship days and uh, I would say like for anyone else the first day on your first ship is always memorable and uh, you suddenly come out of a world where something is called a window and you come on the ship and it's called a portal so in our days we used to have three months of pre-sea training so there wasn't much that we had learned in comparison to cadets of today so the first let's say week on board uh, is something that I remember uh, maybe as a challenge because while we had the determination to make it out at sea uh, the first few days felt like a completely different environment and it needed uh, settling down but I would say the senior cadets and the officers on board were all nice people who kind of helped us to settle in the next big event I would say would be getting command and it so happened that uh, I had to take command in a very short period literally four hours on board okay. and uh, first this was in uh, 1986 uh, 26th of December and it was in the port of Keelung and the way it really went was I landed up on the ship, the previous master, a very senior one, had kept very nice handing over notes, but he said, well, we really don't have time for really doing any handing over. So you have everything uh, here. My flight is in two hours time and I'll be going. You'll find everything here. And here is the certificate folder, which you will need uh, as soon as you're ready to sail. And uh, the I'd been chief officer long enough, so I mean, wasn't a problem in terms of confidence. And the very next thing was that the pilot, since the weather was bad in uh, winter time, the pilot took the ship off the berth and he says, OK, Captain, it's, you're all on your own. I'm not coming out. The weather is too bad. And it was wind force eight to nine. And we were coming out of the Keelung um, har uh, Harbor, which has a pretty narrow breakwater uh, to get in and uh, there was a swell and currents were across the channel so which the pilot had warned me about so it was basically like you know uh, you are getting into your first uh, command with uh, fighting with fire kind of thing so I really don't know how I did that um, first maneuvering four hours after joining after a long flight um, but it went okay and uh, so that's a memorable event I would say I think most people would remember their first command so that was an interesting way to start the, the career as a master during my sailing days of 17 years I would say I sailed with 18 different nationalities and it was great fun in various companies that I sailed with. And I joined Anglo Eastern in 85 as a chief officer. And before that, I've done many companies. Which were the companies, sir? Uh, oh, I started with Iraqi Lines and I've done Sealand Shipping, Arkham Shipping, which was in 
Israeli outfit out of uh, London. I went back to Iraqi lines. I was in uh, all navigation for a short contract and then I was in uh, Transworld, what is now called Transworld, uh, the container company and uh, and did I do another one? Yeah, that's and then Anglo Eastern. So the experience of sailing with different nationalities, I think uh, it was not, not a challenge or an achievement, but I would say it was very interesting because I think my learning was improved by sailing with different nationalities and seeing different viewpoints. The next memorable event would be, I would say, uh, getting selected to get into the office because um, quality assurance and QHSC, as we now call it, didn't really exist in 1992. Uh, there was DNV safety and environment protection rules, which was a precursor and ISM came in 98, as you know. So everything to do with quality assurance was voluntary at that time. And the challenge was, I would call this one a challenge because didn't really have knowledge as a master of a ship of what is an ISO quality standard or what is quality assurance in other industries. So it took me the first three months of really understanding what do we mean by quality assurance because there were no examples to learn from from other companies or from friends. So I started my career literally reading about uh, quality assurance in the automobile industry and other high hazard industries and uh, nuclear. Uh, so read books about various things to try and first understand what was it all about. So that's a memory that I do have in 1992. Uh, the part about writing procedures and manuals was actually very easy compared to understanding the purpose of quality assurance. Uh, so, can we say it was introduced by you? No, it was introduced by me, certainly not. Quality assurance as a field was more from 1950s in other industries. And uh, let's say in ship management, I was one of the earliest ones to get a job which with the title of safety and quality manager. I mean, there were safety and quality managers in all good companies. Uh, from more from a safety perspective, they used to be called the safety officer of the company, but none of them at that time involved what we now understand as ISM code uh, and our industry did not have ships or companies certified uh, with ISO 9000 kind of uh, standards. So that was quite a difference and I think another challenge was getting used to the idea of being almost like a cadet in office life compared to being a master of a ship and I think that's a challenge that most people would face even today switching from sea life to shore life and yes there were moments when one felt that better to go back out at sea when you didn't have so many different viewpoints on a subject and you could make your own decisions. I mean, office life is, as we all know, is different from uh, the way we run a ship uh, in the sense of uh, authority and responsibility and accountability. Everything is kind of decision making by consensus in an office compared to a ship where, especially in those days where we had a lot of freedom about decision making. Uh, the next big challenge to the job, I think, was, or I, I could call it as an achievement, would be when we set up the first classroom for training, training. Uh, which was in 1994, I think, uh, if I remember right. And um, it was unique in the world of ship management for a ship management company to start a training center. And I still remember 1995, we bought the first ship handling simulator from Transas. And everybody in the ship management world thought that I was pretty crazy to spend money on a 
simulator because they were not common in those days. And why would a ship management company have their own simulator? But looking back at it, it was uh, a good decision. And uh, I think today most ship managers do have shipman uh, training centers and do have simulators of their own. So that was a big event. And then the successive expansion of training, each one presented some new challenges. Um, but so we ex expanded from one classroom to two classrooms to five classrooms to a training center that kept growing in Mumbai and then the Delhi one. Uh, but the next major event in life was starting the co Maritime College, Anglo Eastern Maritime Academy. <laughs> because being a Mumbai city dweller, I had no idea about how does one go about buying land in India because every kind of second plot that we saw, something or the other went wrong with the papers that the lawyers would come and say, don't touch this one. There is something in the records uh, which is not very safe for you to buy. So that was quite a challenge. Uh, and the whole, so we bought a school that was um, defunct in Karjat, as you know, and we wanted to set it up as quickly as possible because in those days Anglo Eastern was growing 60, 70 ships every year. And um, we managed to set up everything within three months, right from writing the uh, content for the courses to the DG shipping um, permissions. And I must say thank you to DG because at that time they really were helpful in setting it up very, very quickly. The first batch of 40 students. Uh, and I think the whole journey of taking the college to where it is now with 480 cadets every year uh, passing out from this academy and all getting absorbed by Anglo Eastern has been probably one of the happiest things of, of life to be able to contribute to bringing youngsters into the industry that I love, uh, that I would recommend to anybody even today. Sea life is good life. Sea life has money, sea life has adventure, sea life takes you to different parts of the world. There are not many professions as good as sea life. And um, I would still recommend it to your youngster. Um, yeah, so that was a big, uh, I would say, uh, <clears throat> achievement and a challenge at the same time of setting something up of that nature. And I would say, We've had two mergers of with one with Denom Ship Management in 2001 and one with uh, uh, Uniwan in 2015. I would say both of them have been learning experiences for me. Uh, since combining the safety management systems, trying to amalgamate the working culture of the two companies um, is interesting. Uh, it's a process that happens to in many industries on a regular basis, but if you have not been involved and it's your first time, it does bring about um, a lot of learning experience. So, both how many ships, how many ships they both had during the time of merger? I think uh, Denom's was just over a hundred ships, and Uniwan was also about a hundred and fifteen or something. And we were, I don't remember now, in 2001, we must have been somewhere in the region of 300 ships. And uh, in 2015, we were 450 ships. So we had more ships than the one company that we merged with. So in both cases, we ended up keeping more of our safety management system than the others. We they ran uh, gap analysis and we took the best of the two and we did revise in both the times. So out of my five events, I would say that that was also a good learning experience in both the mergers. 
and uh, in 2006 we started our e-learning platform which for 2006 days we were unique we were the first ship management company in the world to do that in quality assurance in 1993 we were the first company to get certified for quality assurance with dnv similarly in um, e-learning we were the first ship management company to have an e-learning platform of our own i know that all ship managers have one now uh, so it was nice to learn from other industries and bring it into the ship management world so yeah so i would sum up as some of the things that are memorable and uh, they were fun i mean even today for me even though i am retiring every morning i am as enthusiastic about going to work as i was in 1992 and uh, you know so uh, probably one more event that i could say was when i took over the chairmanship of uh, global met uh, which was an honor and a privilege to to serve the industry uh, but representing the industry training world in IMO has also been very satisfying and fulfilling experience. Uh, it's um, it's giving back something to the profession uh, by trying to improve the quality of training centers around the world. And it's been very, I would say, one of the most satisfying parts that my company allowed me to expand my horizon beyond just the company and to let me work in the industry. So I've been allowed to attend IMO meetings since last, I think MSC 67 was the first one and we are at MSC 104 or 105 now. So last 15, 20 years attending those has been a privilege uh, given to me by my company to attend these things. So uh, that exposure to the rest of the world I think I've been lucky to work in a company like Ang Lewiston, which allows that to happen. And it does help in uh, improving our own knowledge about the world, about the industry. Yeah, so I would sum up with that. Uh, I'd like to add one more question with this part. Uh, we listen from many stalwarts from the ship management companies and the training that they were blessed to have got training under you. So under whom you got the training, would, uh, do you, will you name somebody? Uh, it would be a long, long list because I think the way I would say it is that we all learn from each other, from both our juniors and our seniors. And uh, I think if one has an open mind to learning, then one can learn something from each and every person that we come across in life. Uh, and I can tell you that in the last one week, I have been learning a lot about uh, artificial intelligence from a 30 year old person uh, because it's so fascinating, right? This chat GPT and everything. So each and every master I sailed with, I would give some credit to them for teaching something or the other. Someone taught good tips on ship handling. Somebody taught good stuff on cargo handling. Someone taught leadership skills. So I would like to say thank you to all the people that I've worked with and all the people I've worked under or um, yeah, working together with because they all contribute to the way a person's personality changes over the years. And I think I, it would be unfair to say not to say it, but I think I learned a lot from my wife too because she was a psychologist and uh, if I ever wanted a 100% honest opinion about anything, I just had to go to her. So it would be the unfiltered, no, no need for politeness kind of a thing to say as is. So I did learn a lot from her. And lately I would say that I learn a lot from my daughter who's a medical doctor and she gives me the same kind of uh, no BS kind of feedback. And I still remember that I was doing uh, passing out speech in uh, the academy in Mumbai 
and that particular year my daughter happened to come along with me to uh, the academy and while everybody else um, gave me a great ovation for whatever i said my daughter was the only one who said dad you really need to improve your you know capabilities on public speaking i mean you were so boring in parts and um, the audience of course was 19 year olds and so she said there were many things that i said in that speech which were sounding so like an old person so that made me change my style of speaking in karjat after that one so yeah we learn from everybody and uh, it's not fair to name one or two people because everybody has contributed okay thank you So my next question uh, from simulator to digitalization, you have always taken keen interest in modern technology. How has it helped the growth of your organization? Look, the growth of an organization, I think, is a combination. I always like to say that an organization is like a manual watch. You know, it has so many little little gears in it, and you know. jewels and whatever else and if even the small tooth of the smallest gear is broken the accuracy of that watch will not be the same and it may even stop working so i think organizations are similar in the sense that the whole team needs to work together no one individual person or persons can really take credit for an organization to for the growth of an organization so you need all kinds of you know the right recruitment the right training the right people in operations the right people in technical management uh, someone good at marketing someone good at pr so you need all aspects of it to go together and uh, digitalization and simulations and etc yeah i would say that the decision to take ship handling and cargo handling simulators and engine simulators etc that may have come from let's say my proposals but my bosses needed to also have the same vision to grant the money for it right so it wasn't like simulators have made a difference to the growth of the company no the teachers have made some contribution because you can buy the best simulator and not have the right teachers and then it's of no use right so it's the same thing with digitalization we recognized it early so we partnered with uh, whatsella on their first product in 2019 much before other companies had got into it and we have 550 fully connected ships and as you might have read recently we have been very early to adopt starlink for communication purposes because um, again we think that um, it's a game changer and so we went in for it um, as soon as we could and we hope to have 150 ships by the end of the year maybe 200 i mean if there were sufficient antennas and capacity we would do the whole fleet so does that help in the growth of the company not necessarily so but it helps the life of the seafarers and if they get little more better in touch with their families and a little bit better more time to do something else uh, improve the quality of their jobs then i think that will help in the growth of the organization so if every if a company has all parts of it working well together like a watch then the growth automatically happens uh, i am not very fond of um, mba jargon about you know strategy and um, targets for growth etc yes every company wants to grow as much as they can as quickly as they can but at times you also have to take decisions not to grow in order to make sure that you maintain your quality so anglo western has been growing steadily it was 12 ships when i joined the company and today we are 600 and 
75 ships in full management and another 200 in crew pool. So uh, I think uh, there have been certain years within our life cycle where we have chosen not to grow too much because we wanted to consolidate what we had. So as an example, when each of the mergers happened, it was an intentional strategy or decision that growth at this stage is less important than mixing, amalgamating the cultures of the company. So management time was very much uh, kept for that. So to an external party, it may look like Anglo Eastern was not growing, but no, it was growing. It was making the foundation stronger. It was building. I mean, it's like if you're building the next floor for your house, you need to make sure that you have the right foundation, right? You can't just build without a proper foundation, without the proper strengthening. So certain times as a company, we make those kind of decisions uh, to focus on a different aspect. So from 2019, we have been um, spending a lot of time, energy and money on digitalization. And uh, we have been spending a lot of time on learning and being ready for alternate fuels. And uh, today I think we are probably well ahead of the other companies in terms of what we have set up for training for alternate fuels. Uh, we already have ships with LNG as a fuel, LPG as a fuel, uh, biofuels, methanol and ammonia now. We are ready for all of those things and uh, we have been training not only our own people but also for the industry. We did open up the training center for uh, helping the industry. So uh, investment in technologies is one of the factors for the growth but it has to all the the orchestra has to sound beautiful with everybody playing their part of the instrument properly and that's what makes the company grow like a good orchestra uh, today mental health is very uh, important issue for the seafarers and the companies and uh, maritime training is of your core interest. Now the challenge is not only the health, healthy machine, but also the healthy mind of the seafarer to avoid suicide or physical assault on the ship. How should the industry prepare itself to minimize the accidents due to the machine and the space full mind of the on the ship? Very good question. <laughs> Mental health has always, I mean, lack of mental health with some individuals has always been around, not only in shipping, but in all industries. The society in general has a stigma around mental health. And the reason is very easy to understand that when we have an injured limb, a broken hand, it's easy to see what is wrong with the individual. But because in mental health, there is no visible characteristic to see, we often tend to neglect what's going on in the mind of the individual. And this has been an evolution of society in general, that we are understanding mental health better as we go along. So if you take the post World War II generation, it was all about being tough, do not cry, face everything, hardships are part of life, etc, etc. Nobody was really keeping statistics of how many of the World War II veterans were having mental health issues, right? Nobody looked at it till the Vietnam War also. It's only after such wars when research studies showed the amount of problems that those veteran soldiers were having when society became more and more, I would say, caring for each other, that's when we started talking a lot more about mental health. Uh, there are two things that need to change in our world. One is empathy has to be much higher. And I must say that our industry today in crewing 
is not yet as an industry we are not empathetic enough right typically what happens to someone who signs off on a medical mental health issue there is a big argument in each company do we rehire this person or do we not and for the simple reason that people are scared that that person may go and commit suicide on the next ship etc etc but that's in my view a very wrong way to handle mental health because by being if we go too much on one side of harshness and we say the best way to manage this risk is not to take the person again we forget that we are taking away the livelihood of that person taking the salary away from a family so let's say a chief officer has a mental health issue for whatever reason right i mean do we really want to now this man has spent 10 12 years out at sea that's his only skill set is it fair to just say we will not rehire him right so i think we need to take more advice from mental health experts doctors uh, about it in a empathetic way to decide and or let the medical professional decide that is there a major risk or not because just like some of these things in my experience what i know like people take a tablet every day for high blood pressure or diabetes control or whatever similarly if somebody is declared mentally healthy enough to join back see with taking one kind of a tablet or whatever the doctor has prescribed to me it is unfair then not to employ such people back because in the same way that if a person with some kind of a medical condition which requires a daily tablet can be a high risk if he doesn't take his medicine or it doesn't carry his medicine or runs out of medicines out at sea it's the same for the mental health person right that if he doesn't take his medicine maybe he will again have a bout of that mental illness also people forget that mental health varies time to time also there are certain things that are of temporary nature so if somebody has the misfortune of losing a child for example that trauma is is very very high at that moment in time but given a period of time uh, time tends to heal certain wounds right so similarly like uh, we need to recognize through the help of doctors that was this is this something that we can help that person with can we give him an extra 4 months of leave can we help him with a counselor can we provide some kind of a help to that person to get over that trauma that would be the empathetic way of dealing with it but quite often in our industry we don't take the long view on it and we don't rehire such people so i think the society as a whole i mean youngsters today and there are statistics about it the rate of committing suicide at a young age has tripled in some countries over the last 20 years right i'm sure if you google suicide rates in different countries you will see a graph going upwards in many countries and part there are many reasons to how a society changes right and i imagine the present wars that are going down around right ukraine sudan iraq in the past afghanistan in the past each of these wars must be producing mental health problems for many people who have lost their loved ones like entire families wiped out or half the family wiped out so in all of these cases human beings tend to be resilient and fight back and most of them continue to hold good jobs so we need to do the same with our seafarers give them as much help as we can and think about it from their viewpoint right would we want to lose our job our livelihoods 
because on one particular day or for a month or three months, we had a trauma that was causing us not to be focused on our job. So if the world and I, I have taken this up many times with um, people in the unions, ITF, ILO, these kind of places mm -hmm. that we need to give more guidance to the profession about how to deal with it. And recently in an intertanko meeting two weeks ago, this topic was again discussed in detail. It has been discussed in various PNI club forums that I happen to attend. So I think over the next five years, we need to come up with better guidelines for the industry on how to deal with mental health in a humane way, in a nice way. So my advice to young people would be try and understand yourself well. And there is a lot of guidance available on every ship from the company, from bodies like ISWAN, um, seafarers helplines are available, companies most like us are providing psychologists and psychiatrists available on a phone call, on a helpline, and these helplines, the company doesn't interfere with what the seafarer is speaking with the professional doctor. So I would say to the youngsters, don't suffer in loneliness, don't suffer by yourself. If you are feeling something, take the help therapy. Going for therapy is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. You know, like we go to a doctor for a pain in the back or in the arm, if there is something that is occupying your mind in a, and causing distress to the mind, seek help as soon as possible. All these, most of these things can be cured. Uh, sir, my next question is, uh, you are retiring from ASM, but we are sure that you are not retiring from shipping activities. What are your plans to contribute for shipping and double mail? Okay, I would certainly say I'm not going to disappear into the jungle or do fishing every day. Um, the plan is certainly is to con continue with Global Met and in fact try and give more time to Global Met than I have been able to give. Uh, I do plan to continue in as many industry activities that I can. Um, and I do plan to continue in the field of training, learning, mentoring, um, and trying to I don't want to say that there is anything special about me, but whatever good or bad that I can mentor people who want to be mentored by me, I would want to do that. And it's up to the people who listen to the older person what they want to accept and what they want to reject. But from my side, I do hope to be able to continue working in the industry which I do enjoy and I haven't got bored of shipping and I haven't got bored of ships and I haven't got bored of doing things with seafarers so and I would like to stay in touch with the younger people uh, because I as an older person you get more energy when you interact with young people and see their enthusiasm and I don't think I'm obsolete with technology so I do plan to continue learning the new technologies that come up. Uh, I may not be making decisions for a company, but I certainly hope to learn all about artificial intelligence. How can it be used in ship management, in shipping? How do we learn more from machinery analytics? So we presently have a project going on to connect all our ships with machinery, live machinery analytics. I would love to continue in those kind of fields somewhere or the other um, because um, I think my mental makeup is such that if I was to do nothing, uh, I, I would lose the will to live. So I do want to uh, continue to do things which are meaningful, which are enjoyable and uh, which can contribute to the merchant marine. I. I don't think I can do much in other fields because my knowledge base is very limited to maritime. So yes, that I do plan to continue. 
And then, would you like to add anything else if I was Mr. Vasu? I would just like, relevant. I what think I would just like to thank everybody who with whom I have interacted in my life um, so far uh, because retirement is kind of a watershed moment and uh, I would like to apologize to anybody whom I've hurt over the years and I would like to thank everybody who who has mentored me or taught me something and most of all I think I want to say I've been privileged to have very, very nice colleagues in everything in life. I think I've been a lucky individual. Um, so I think um, I would like to you know, remain in touch with as many people as I can. Uh, because um, to me, retirement is just one phase of life. And, uh, you know, it's like going down the, to a different road to a different destination uh, and still enjoying that journey in the future. Thank you so much, sir. And thanks for sparing your time and giving time from Thank you so much once again. Most welcome. Thank you for having me on your program. Thank you so much, sir.